Hello and welcome back to World War One TV. And look, I've got Woody is back to help us. It's been a while. You've been busy, bee, Woody. Uh, always, yeah, but it's it's calming down now theoretically. So yeah, no, I'm glad to be here. Wicked. Um, I'm really looking forward to tonight because I think um it's going to be cool to. I'm really glad that you've joined us as well because you've got so much sort of, you know, knowledge and and sort of interest in the kit side of things and that might come up a bit I mean we're talking predominantly trenches but we can't get away with it with our guest who is absolute expert on on all things kit wise as well and I'm going to bring him in because I know we're running a bit late today um Taff hello hello how are you doing I'm very well thank you yeah and thanks for the invite it's very nice to be asked uh yeah well it's absolutely wonderful to have you here um I've known you for, for quite a while online. I know Woody's known you much longer. Um, you're always my yeah. go-to. You're always my go-to man for like if I just have questions about anything trench trench to do with trenches or anything to do with uniforms and kit because I'm terrible at that kind of thing. Um, and you always like the most helpful person for me because it's just not my forte. So yeah, just a bit of public praise there for you, Taff. That's very kind. I always like to be helpful if I can. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah. talk tonight, and I mean. When we first started this channel, we kind of said, um, well, between us, me and Woody, were like, I don't want it to be typical, the stuff you see on the First World War, where it's just all trenches, all Western yeah, Front. Yeah, and so yeah. we've had quite a lot of shows looking at, you know, international aspects of the conflict. But we can't get away from the fact that trench warfare was an integral part of the war. And there is so much that people think they know about it that isn't true, you know, got this idea that people spend months on end in trenches um you know that they were constantly fighting constantly under shell fire and so it's going to be really nice tonight for you to shine a bit of light on actually the reality of that situation for for the chaps that were involved yeah no i'm looking forward to it as well i mean as you say um it's a very common thing i mean um just over the years, I, I've always tried to um, go and do talks specifically for groups of people who really have no particular interest in the First World War, uh, because, I mean, a lot of people, if you groups for the Western Front Association and, uh, and and groups like that already come with a with a knowledge, a level of expectation. But to me, there's a great deal of pleasure in going to big groups, big groups, but women's institute conferences or University of the Third Age, uh, family history conferences, all sorts of things where uh, people have a, an inkling about the First World War, but actually know very little. Because as a day job, doing the uh, providing uniforms, equipment, weapons, props, historical advice, things like that, especially the historical advice for film and television, we bump against um, this sort of immovable object all of the time. And that is that the people that make television, the people that commission television, that direct it, that produce it, that write it, all have a very, very narrow, simplistic, inaccurate view of the First World War. Um, most of that was picked up at school and in a lot of cases they're, they're, a lot of them have got um, English literature degrees that's that's just a fact in the in, in the world that we operate in um, and they cannot and will not be budged from the idea that Siegfried Sassoon and Wilfred Owen wrote the official history of the First World War and that somewhere along the line these dreadful modern historians are turning up uh, just twisting it all just to sell books um, and it's a shame. It's a huge shame, uh, especially seeing as that the reality is that they they always bash the generals. Oh, generals are idiots. The, the officers in command, the platoon commanders, they're all idiots. And of course, the reality is that in nearly every instance, a century ago, they would have been those very infantry officers, colonels, battalion commanders, brigadiers, generals even, who would have been responsible. And I think there's a real irony there that they can't stand back far enough to to literally apply some common sense to it. because. When I go and do the talks, that's literally what I do. It's it's about context. It's about perspective. Um, and it's not about me saying my version of history is right, what you think is wrong. It's about, well, here are all the facts. Why don't you work that out for yourself? And nine times out of 10, the public lap it up. In fact, actually, 99 times out of 100, I can do a talk for hundreds of people. And at the end of the evening, there's never a time when they come after me and give me a hard time. All you can hear as they leave the room is, that's really interesting. I didn't know that. Had you thought about it like that? Oh, no. You know. And and they're suddenly going, oh, well, actually, that, actually thinking about it, my, my dad did say something about that. And all the way through, you, you see that it's pushing on an open door because mm -hmm. the film and telly people go, oh, no, no, you can't possibly do that. People have a fixed view and we have to deliver what they what they expect. Well, 
that's completely nuts because they wouldn't dream of doing that if they were making a documentary or a drama about the Second World War. But yeah, that's so true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that, just to jump in, sorry. The, the Second yeah. World War, you could pretty much start it in any kind of terrain or every yeah. any time of climate with any type of colour uniform and it would kind of work. Yeah. But First World yeah. War, you kind of would need to have sandbags when, <laughs> and, and barbed well, wire. It wouldn't, just, it wouldn't but of course, right. but of course, that's the problem. That's the argument yeah. that I get. Oh, that this is it. You, you you go into a meeting with the art department before they've filmed anything, and when you go into the art department office, pinned to the wall, the first four photographs will always be the same ones. That the, the fellas on Pilkham Ridge lugging the stretcher through the mud, the guys pulling the field gun out of the mud, um, that the mule stuck in the mud, and, and and you say to them, you know, you're you're making a film about about, about early 1915 or or the last days of the war in 1918. And what what you've got pinned to the wall represents a few days or, or or a few weeks of one month of one battle of one year in a four year war, and mm. it's not even typical of the battle. We go, oh, Battle of Passchendaele, it was all mud and everybody drowned. Well, you know, there are parts of the Battle of Passchendaele, like Battle of Third Eap, to give it its proper name, where it was so hot that. Columns of marching troops heading towards the front line were just generating these huge clouds of dust and the Germans were shelling them. You know, so blokes weren't getting killed in the mud. People were getting killed because of the sunshine and it was so hot they were generating all this dust. But this image, this very narrow image has come to be, it's shorthand, it's lazy shorthand. Yeah. That's all it is. And in the same way that you say to them, well, you know, no man's land. Oh yeah, well, we've decided what no man's land is going to be and it's going to be this big muddy wasteland. And you go, well, you do know that no man's land was abandoned farmland. And when you abandon farmland, you end up with lots of straggly weeds, you know, normally at least as high as your knees. And when you look at things like um, Beadle's famous painting of the 36th Ulster Division going over the top on the first day on the Somme, there they are climbing out of the trench and they are literally up to their knees in straggly weeds. That's the reality. And it's green. And so many fellas, their account of it, they'd spent weeks or months below ground in the chalk, in the in the dirt, and suddenly they pulled themselves to the top of the trench ladders and they couldn't believe how green it all still was because most of the time no man's land is just a green, a green field. It's just an overgrown farmland. And the problem with that is that it's still got the plough ruts in it where they might have sunk a bit, but they'll still be there from the last time the field was ploughed. Um, it it uh, obviously, as birds drop seeds, there'll be there'll be sort of bushes starting to grow, trees starting to grow. And when you think of a shell hole, yeah, in your mind, right this second, you will be thinking of a big hole in the ground full of brown earth when it's thrown all this dark earth around it. And it will be the minute it's suddenly been made. But when it's been there three months, six months, a year, it's full of grass, it's overgrown. So as you're trotting along across no man's land, you won't even see it until you've fallen in it. That's the big problem with, with no man's land. It's, it's, a, it's an obstacle course. But it's not an obstacle course of just big shell holes filled with muddy water most of the time. Of course, there were times in 1917 that was the case, but it wasn't the case the vast majority of the time. But we've kind of allowed this situation to, to arise where we've created a very simplistic narrative uh, of, oh, well, this is what the First World War looks like. Um, and during the centenary, it was, it was nuts. I, I helped uh, work on some scripts for a, a five-part series called The Passing Bells. And it's the, it's the only occasion I've ever got in contact with a producer before they've screened it and said, do me a favor, take my name off the credits. I, <laughs> and, uh, because it had every cliche. But the, the most frustrating thing of all was that they had November 1918, the, uh, the last day of the war, you've got British and German soldiers in opposing trenches with barbed wire. And you say to them, you know, that, that by the time you get to the end of the war, they're, they're, they are 70 miles past the, the nearest trench system, as far as the British army are concerned. I mean, it's again with the recent, you know, awful adaptation of All Quiet on the Western Front, you know, that whole sort of trench systems right up to the last minute. It, the, 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 the front line has advanced so far, it's moved so far past that, that it's open fields, it's, it's leafy countryside, it's orchards, it's untouched villages. And that's the story. You know, all you're doing, you're just repeating a load of nonsense because you're lazy. And, and it's a shame because actually the story of, of the Germans trying to, you know, with hardly any manpower left, with hardly any materials left, with hardly any food left, with hardly any uh, medical supplies left, the fact that, they, that, they, that the whole thing wasn't a complete route is the story. And yet, very good script writers, um, 
Oh, I can't think what was his name. Was it Tony Jordan who who'd written EastEnders? He'd uh, uh, one of my great heroes for writing um, Life on Mars, which I thought was fantastic. Oh, which I thought absolutely captured 1973, having having lived through 1973. But when it came to the First World War, he clearly didn't do what he'd done for for Life on Mars and research it to the nth degree. He'd gone, oh, I know about the First World War. It's all that stuff with all mud and trenches, and then but, he put every trope in it. I I think a lot of this, and I mean I, I've worked in tv a bit and you know i've worked on trying to get things commissioned with a couple of production companies that the channels are not interested unless it's some or patchendale generally speaking it's quite hard to get things uh, get things yeah. commissioned first world war based and i've come to the conclusion it, as you say there's there's an element of laziness and there's an element of this this assumption that this is what the people want so this is what we'll give them yeah. And actually, yeah. that really undervalues and underestimates the, the public's appetite for, for real yeah. history, the yeah. same old stuff, you know. Uh, and I, I share your frustration on that. But I wonder, too, if um, we've, we're going to have Carla Jean Stokes on, who is expert yeah. in sort of First World War photography uh, in, in a few weeks' time. And I wonder, iconic, that it's it's you know even the that it's just given as fact because it's an image where it's there in black and white that must have been what it was like the whole time you know I long for a tv show or a film covering the war of movement in the first world war you know but I think people are worried that it wouldn't be recognized as that but it's kind of a vicious circle because if you don't tell them that's what it was like then they're not going to recognize it as that yeah know? and I think there's also the fact that I mean Certainly, when we we first started working in television a very long time ago, <clears throat> uh, the commissioning editors, um, men and women who were a lot older, had a lot more experience just of the world in general, and were prepared to to say to people coming to them with program ideas, "I didn't know anything about that. That's fascinating. Yeah, go away and work that up." Whereas now it's like, "Oh, oh no, no, no! The First World War is this," and that's such a shame. Um, I mean, we saw the same thing with the centenary, such an opportunity to tell a much bigger, much more interesting story. Um, uh, Rachel Hogg, who was a, a, a very long standing BBC researcher, lovely lady I'd worked on many times. She was brought out of retirement um, specifically to begin with to work on the, the BBC coverage for the opening of the uh, of, of the centenary commemorations. Um, and uh, I can remember a, a saying to me in the weeks leading up to it, we'd done all sorts of stuff. We've got all sorts of ideas. I'd sent her all sorts of stuff, which she'd worked up. And then right at the last minute on the morning of the of the 4th of August in 2014, she rang me up and said, oh, Taft, darling, you're, you're going to hate it. I'm so sorry. They've just chucked everything out and it's just going to be tin hats and poetry and, and, and nonsense. And she said, it's it's such a shame because, that you know, the, the, the story of 1914, the mobilisation of the British Army, over the five days went without a hitch. The uh, the whole process of getting the army mobilized into France went without a hitch. There wasn't a single train late. There wasn't a, a single man who didn't get to France on time. It was an extraordinary undertaking, let alone what the original British Expeditionary Force and the men of the old Contemptibles actually achieved as a tiny, tiny, tiny little army, which had fantastic equipment and fantastic uniforms and fantastic gear, but there just weren't enough of them to make a difference. And there wasn't a single bit of that story told yeah, in 2014 it's, it's anywhere. Certainly a missed opportunity. But look, um, t t tonight is an opportunity, I suppose, to, to, to try and sort of right some of those wrongs in some ways. And and so Trench is, you know, we've established, right, it's not all it's not all mud. It's not all getting shelled 24-7 for months on end. What was life in the trenches really like, Taff? I mean, I think that the... the, the the, the most crucial point of all is that the, the, the that there is no answer to that question in the same way a few days ago somebody popped up online and asked the question oh I've been looking in a in a trench trenching manual and can you say to me that all trenches the front bit of the trench was always 18 feet long well no no not at all because it all evolves all of the time so when they go to France in 1914, they know about trenches. You know, trenches are as old almost as a history of warfare. You know, the minute someone's shooting at you, whether it's with bows and arrows or lobbing rocks at you or whatever, you want to get out the way. Um, certainly, you know, the, the, there'd been um, trenches in the American Civil War. There'd been uh, trenches in the um, in the Franco, uh, in, yeah, some in the Franco-Prussian War. There'd been some in the Russo-Japanese War. So trench warfare was something that they, they knew about, they planned for, they trained for. And, but, 
in that early war of movement, it's all about jockeying for the best positions. And when you get to the stage where you can't get the better of one another in open countryside, in rural France, you'll use what's there. So essentially that's drainage ditches at the side of a field. So to begin with, for the first, really, the first few months of the war, as it settles down, uh, most trench warfare utilizes drainage ditches at the side of the field. They're still doing that by Christmas and into the early part of 1915. In fact, even at uh, e even in, in in the march at the Battle of Neuve Chapelle, a lot of the fellows are making their way towards the front line using drainage ditches, which are there because they're already there. And then yeah. they start linking them up. They start linking them up with shell holes. They start getting deeper. 1915 is very much the year of bodge so right what have we got to make life a bit more comfortable where there's the remains of a house we'll have the door off it we'll have the window frames we'll have some of the roof beams to prop the side up and there's some wonderful photographs of the queen's westminster rifle sitting in a trench where the front of the trench is like this you know and they've just propped it up and moved out or, or tried to repair it they've just propped it up and are working around it um and i suppose really that the stuff that we're most familiar with are the trenches of 1916 because the point that you made earlier, we see the same old photographs and the same old footage over and over and over again. Not because the Imperial War Museum don't have thousands of miles of original footage of film or because archives around the world and in private collections, there aren't hundreds of thousands or millions of photographs which show you exactly what it was like, but because researchers making a documentary or whatever go to the search room at the IWM and pretty much just, just take the first stuff that, that, that they come across because frankly, most of the time, they don't know any different. Um, I mean, when we were working on the trench back in 2001, Richard Van Emden went to the, the IWM specifically looking for stuff um, around Flesquier, which is where uh, we were we were billeted, where, where we built the trench system in France, and found some fantastic footage of the farmyard that we'd actually got the Hull Pal volunteers, the lads from Hull, actually billeted in. Um, and it, it was untouched. It was all exactly as it was at the time. So it's there if you go and look for it, but most people don't. So anyway, the trenches of 1916 are the stuff we're most familiar with. By the time you get to 1917, it's in a way, it's a, it starts getting really technical. So if you wanted a, a dugout, you dig an enormous hole. The Royal Engineers will turn up with a prefabricated frame. They'll bolt it all together. It'll be lined. They'll then have a load of railway sleepers over the top, a load of railway irons the other way, another row of railway sleepers. There'll be a six foot of earth. And then on top of that, three or four feet of brick rubble and broken bits of concrete, which is what they call the bursting layer. So if a shell lands on the bursting layer, it goes off on the top rather than punch its way through and go off inside, which is what it had done. So all the time, this constant process of learning, evolving, how does this work? You know, the same as the warfare generally. Try this, doesn't work, don't do it next time. What about this? What about that? All of the time, the lessons learned, fed back, sent out, disseminated to units. So when we say what was trench warfare like? Well, the trenches continually changed. The life in the trenches continually changed. I mean, to begin with, they, they, they work during the day and they sleep at night because that's what we always do. But they realise quite quickly that that just means that a lot more blokes get killed because you can be seen moving around during the day. So then they reverse the day and uh, and sleep through the night. Um, trench routine, uh, they, they develop a trench routine quite slowly to begin with, but it becomes much more formalised. Um, and, and the length of time that you stay in the trenches, I mean, by the time you get to December 1914, some of the trenches down near Plug Street, uh, the, 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 the literally a muddy ditch, and it's up to your neck in freezing cold muddy water. Well, you're not going to stand that for more than a day. <laughs> and the army knew that. The army knew that you had to have soldiers in, in the peak of fighting ability to be able to fight the Germans. So if you're going to leave them there for two or three days until they just shrivel and, and, and wilt away, they're not going to be able to do anything. So those fellas would be pulled out and swapped with, with somebody else until very quickly they realised that, a, a, a trench that's permanently full of water where your rifle's sitting on a pile of mud and is going to keep sinking and you're going to have to keep moving it is not a sustainable situation so you move back and you find somewhere that does work and and that's something that they they realize quite quickly that actually if something's untenable you need to you need to move there's no point in staying somewhere where you can be shot at from three sides or where, or where the ground is literally um untenable or where, or where you can be over, overlooked um and so all of the time they're, they're learning that lesson. I mean, the Germans are, you know, by the time they reach the sort of the midway point of the Battle of the Somme, Falkenhayn says to the German army, you must recapture every single piece of land that you lose. And the Germans lose some fantastic troops just trying to recapture utterly worthless patches of chalk and mud, which have no strategic use at all, just to just to keep Falkenhayn happy. But by then the British aren't doing that. They've gone, actually, no, we, we can't defend this. We've got, we've got further forward than we expected, but 
to be honest, we need to pull back to a place that we can actually defend. And both sides are learning. So as fast as one side's come up with a way of doing something, then the other side will find a way of dealing with it. And and all of the time, it's just gradually creeping forward. So. We, um... <laughs> we, we had uh, we had Peter Hart on the other day, and he sort of. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, <laughs> if I'd have known, I'd have come around and stopped him. <laughs> yeah, he used this analogy of two roller coasters next to each other, yeah. the learning yeah. process, which I really yeah. liked actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, yeah. this, this, I actually wonder now. You've kind of been talking. My thought is, you know, is a lot of this view that we have of trench warfare, this idea of men stuck in you know muddy trenches for weeks and months on end does this sort of come from little link back to this idea that you know as you said earlier that you know that the officers that the generals didn't care and it's kind of like i mean you know poor bloody infantry always anyway but you know yeah. it's that idea of as if, as if it was all disposable and as if nobody cared and of course the big thing this idea that it was just one trench line just yes. just one yeah. one line of trenches yeah. you know which yeah. obviously yeah. is not the case no, I mean, they evolve again. So to begin with, there is one line of trenches. They they then realise that actually if the Germans overcome this, there's nothing behind us. So we need to build another line to support it. And then eventually it kind of settles down with a third line. So you've got a front line, you've got a support line, then there's a reserve line. So you've then got the uh, you've got three lines of trenches. And uh, the, 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 that becomes the sort of the, the main building block throughout most of the war until the beginning of 1918. And the idea with that is that if a battalion takes over the line in a fairly quiet period, then you, you, you've got four companies. So one company goes into the front line, one into the support line, one into the reserve line. The others are out at rest. But rest didn't mean having a rest. Rest just meant a rest from being in the trenches. So the guys out at rest would do all the fetching and carrying. They'd bring all the ammunition. They'd bring all the food because the fellas in the trenches, their job was to stay in the trenches. It wasn't to go back and get stuff. Because at any point, the Germans might show up and you can't go, well, actually, where, where's number five platoon? Oh, well, they're, they're off, you know, somewhere 10 miles away, picking up some you know, crates of food. So the guys out at rest would always bring all the stuff, do the fetching and carrying. And the whole process, it was front line. You then go back to the support line, then to the reserve line, then out at rest. And it, this sort of four part cycle for, for quiet parts of the line, front line, support line, reserve line, rest, front line, support line, reserve line, rest. And you do that until the battalion was then pulled out um and, and sent off for a proper rest and it wouldn't necessarily be that long i mean sometimes they're there for three days sometimes they're there for 10 days sometimes it might be up for a couple of weeks it, and again it depends on what it's like because for huge chunks of the war there was quite a live and let live sort of attitude because it's just tiring all the time if you're just lobbing shells at one another or shooting at one another and of course, that's a problem in its own right, because if you get to the stage where people really can't be asked to go and fight the Germans, it's going to be very difficult when you yeah. need them to get out of the trenches and mm. go and fight them properly. So at that point, the British start this uh, policy of, uh, of owning no man's land. You need to be more offensive. You've got to get out into no man's land. You've got to occupy no man's land, deny it to the Germans, which meant patrolling. It meant listening patrols right up by the German wire, trying to listen, see whatever snippets of information you could pick up. Um, raids where you'd go and try and snatch a German prisoner, ideally a live one, but if he's a dead one, at least you'll, you'll find what unit he's in with his shoulder straps and what he might have in his pockets. Um, and I mean, the, the Wipers Times, the trench newspaper, there's always there's a funny line in that, which uh, an advert saying, are you offensive enough? You know, am I being offensive enough? And that was born out of a, 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 a instructions for, for infantry officers. It was a little it was a little card, actually, one here somewhere. Um, so a little card like this. Um, which was literally some of the many questions a platoon commander should ask himself on taking over a trench and at frequent intervals afterwards. Here I am. Uh, no, I am here for two purposes, to hold this line under all circumstances and to do as much damage as possible to the enemy. Am I doing all I can to make this line as strong as possible? Am I as offensive as I might be with organizing snipers, sniper scopes, rifle grenades, catapults and patrols? And basically, it's a it's a little aid to memoir to, to just to encourage you all the time to make sure that you've got enough ammunition, that your men's rifles are clean, that they haven't got trench foot. I mean, again, another thing, this whole, oh, well, all the men had trench foot because the trenches were awful. The army cure trench foot really, really quickly. And the way that they cure trench foot, obviously, simple precautions like take your boots off twice a day, dry your feet, um, put whale oil on your feet, or sometimes it might be talcum powder, then put another pair of socks on that aren't as wet as the ones that you've just taken off. <laughs> and they typically do that twice a day in, in wet and muddy weather just to make sure that the feet are in good order. But the way that they enforce it, the way that they make sure that that happens is that they stop punishing the soldiers and they punish the platoon commander. So if you're mm. 
trench foot. That's your fault, not theirs. And funnily enough, trench foot is almost eradicated immediately. Yes, it did. Yeah, wow. that was one of the things my great granddad, my, my grandma always said um, that her dad had bad feet. For, you yeah. know that was one thing that he that he did have but but you're right this is all about you know as we've said and this is probably i think going to become the overarching theme of world war one tv is learning i, I think it's come yeah. up in every yeah. show um yeah. and it's just a, a quick question here that's come up which kind of pertains to it yeah. when did they first zigzag the trenches you know yeah well, so i mean th th that really is 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 quite early on i mean even in sort of pre-war entrenchment manuals uh the idea that if 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 you're heading towards the enemy and the enemy can shoot straight down your trench, then you've got no cover. You're going to get hit wherever you are in a sort of a quarter of a mile length. So even before the war, they'd started that process of zigzagging around. So if you come under fire, you just duck down and, and they can't see you. And then you can gradually work your way forward. So um, things like that and the uh, and the, the sort of the castellations, if you like, again, they're in early trench, trenching manuals. And the other thing that cropped up again on, on Twitter the other day, somebody was saying, so, you know, they would all be exactly the same. They'd all be very neat because the manual show them like that. And certainly when you're being trained somewhere behind the lines or, or if you're somewhere in sunny Suffolk on a, on a, on a nice dry Tuesday in the perfect safety at home, then you can dig trenches, which are exactly 18 feet long with the proper returns of nine feet and, and so on and so on. But in the dark, um, where you don't really know where you are, where you're trying to work it out with lengths of string and materials coming up, which which might be six foot long. So you can make a handy 18 foot out of three planks. But actually, these ones have turned up and they're only four feet or they're five feet. Then the stuff is all sorts of shapes. And, and, and it does the job because it's it's got this sort of castellations in it, because the idea being that if a shell lands in one part of it, it'll only damage that bit. It won't blast around the corner. But you've only got to look at aerial photographs to realize that hardly a single trench has straight and even um, pieces of trench in it. It, it. Just because it's just not something that gangs of blokes can do in the dark effectively. Um, but again, all the way through the, the learning process. I mean, what another man I turned up the other day for, for something totally different um, was trench making by night, a handy manual for making trenches by night. And what was fascinating about that is that, the very first part of it is about when you leave your trench, uh, literally, you, you've got a pick and a shovel. Well, you carry one one way up and one the other so that you don't clang the heads of the two together. And you go, well, that's obvious. And as you work your way through the manuals, what you realise very quickly is that all army manuals ever were is formalised common sense. In whatever situation, mm. what's the best thing to do? Well, do this. And all the way through, right, okay, this should be obvious, but let's just make sure they all know, pick one way up, shovel the other, so they're not going to clang together. And it's that all the way through. It's right. Well, before you do anything else, make sure you don't all get killed getting there by making a row. That's and one of those things that I just think, yeah, it should be obvious, but actually I, I wouldn't think of that. Maybe that's just because I'm a yeah. bit dim, but like it's no, one of those yeah, things yeah. that folks but the broke probably did and it probably got passed as you know we're talking about learning we're also talking about learning people to people learning people talking yeah. to one another so maybe small groups of yeah. you know people yeah. might have known but yeah getting that getting that codified getting that in documentation yeah. and out to yeah. troops that's the key isn't it and it's like it is. like we always say there's no such thing as a stupid question you know put yeah, everything absolutely. in there you know absolutely but i'm going to just jump yeah. in there because that that idea of learning in the trenches and passing it from man to man and, and the evolution of the war and evolution of trenches, that all makes complete sense to, to a basic First World War novice like me. But we have to, where does this myth of it all being sitting in trenches full of water up to your knee come from? Because if you're a Tommy in the whatever, Warwickshire Regiment in 1916, you can't be writing back home to your mum and dad about the four lines of trenches and how you're evolving tactics and how you're doing this and that there's a big plan because we're going to be doing manoeuvre in the next year. So maybe what you all you can write about is the fact the food was a bit boring and you're stuck in one place. So did it start in the Great War itself, the idea of the trenches being the be on end? Because it's obviously it way predates Blackadder goes forth and that kind of thing, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, obviously, Blackadder sets the, the study of the Great War back by about 40 years when it turns up. But, but the, yeah, I mean, the, the thing is that obviously trenches were a thing. There's no denying yeah. trenches were a thing. There's no denying that if you're stuck in a, in, in a hole in the summer, it's not too bad. By the time the weather turns, it's pretty grim. 
Um, I mean, the real irony was that when you spoke to the veterans, you say, you know, what was the worst? You know, uh, you, you naturally expect, oh, it was terrible when it was cold and when it was wet. But they'd always say, to be honest, that the really hot days were the days when it sapped your strength. You had to have mm. your jacket on all the time in the front line and the support line. Your equipment was on all the time. When steel helmets were introduced, you had to wear it. It wasn't optional because if you got a head wound, not only would you get a wound, you would then be punished for, 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 for negligence because you got a head wound, despite the fact the army had given you the means of not having a head wound. And you, you've worn tin hats long enough to know that in the baking hot sun, it just cooks your head. So yeah, that's, that is sort of sealed, doesn't it? And then the, <laughs> yeah. the, the air above it just gets hotter that's and it. hotter and hotter. And then you, you, when exactly you finally that. release it, it kind of goes, Tsh. yeah, exactly <laughs> that. And that. It's absolutely contradictory to what you'd expect. You go, well, surely you'd like a nice, hot, sunny day. But like I said, on a hot, sunny day, it just sapped every last bit of energy you'd got and you could do nothing about it. If it's a bit cold and a bit miserable, you can move around and warm up. There's ways mm. to warm up. But there aren't ways to cool down. Um, so absolutely during the war, people knew about muddy trenches. Uh, people like Ben's father, the cartoonist, were coming up with, you know, if you knows of a better hole joke. So, uh, you know, old Bill having a bath, you know, and Bert saying, what time do they feed the sea lions? So shell holes full of muddy water. It was a joke. It was stuff that people knew. But of course, the people at the time, the, the soldiers at the time knew that that was just a tiny part of life that, yeah. uh, you know, but, but, and, and actually, and all the time that the, the bulk of the veterans were still alive, they knew the truth but of course really i suppose it, it's it does always come back to the media because it's such a convenient shorthand mm -hmm. you don't have to do any work you just have to show a bit of mud bit of blood bit of barbed wire and the inbuilt thing that most people have got oh yeah first world war yeah and yeah. and it's easy and i've said to you know to, to art department people you know if you were working on call a midwife you would go out of your way to make sure that it was 1956 and not 1953 and that the papers were right and the and the packaging was right and the vehicles were right and yet here you go oh yeah first world war i'm gonna i'm just gonna make four weeks at passchendaele irrespective of what part of the four-year war it is which it's you wouldn't do in the second war it's weird mm. as well because um i mean yeah i do think obviously like Woody said, obviously, as a soldiers and their view is obviously narrow to just their experience. We get that because that's what everybody. But so often when you're reading letters, you know, that were written home, they're not they're not negative. Then they're the opposite, because oftentimes blokes would deliberately say the positive yeah. so as not to worry people. So as yeah. not to say, oh, well, actually, you know, this is a bit bloody miserable. I've yeah. been here. I'm soaking wet. You know, it was yeah. the opposite. You You'd say, I mean. Amongst themselves, sure, we all know soldiers love to moan about things. I was married to one, so <laughs> I can definitely confirm that. But you know, it's actually stuff coming home at that during that period wouldn't have been that way. So I mean, it's a post-war I mean, thing, or no? I mean, I do. I mean, I do think that it starts at the time. I mean, obviously, I mean, actually, the, the, the bit about the letters is really interesting because it's a very popular thing with schools. You know, teachers will say, "Oh, I get the kids to write a letter as if they're writing home from the trench." And I say to them, "What do you get them to write?" Oh, well, it's all about mud and rats and all that. And I said, "Have you ever read proper trench letters?" Because mm. the fellows never mention it, or very rarely. It's always about the positive stuff. They're always saying, "Well, what's happening at home? Has the far harvest been brought in yet?" Thank Auntie Mabel for the scarf. And there's always an Auntie Mabel. And <laughs> and I said to them, "What you need to do is get." the kids to know how grim it is and to write a letter home that doesn't mention that because that's much harder to do um i mean there there certainly was a lot of stuff coming back a lot of people did write letters home saying how grim it was i mean jim grundy's done some fantastic work and um, the newspapers that he's gone through up in nottinghamshire uh, where he finds some incredible letters written by fellows at the front which are published in newspapers um in theory a lot of it was meant to be censored it certainly wasn't all so you, you there's a lot of warts and all stuff that does make it back so i think people weren't in any illusions to what was happening but they get, they get a lot of people that, yeah they they lived a much harder life anyway people you know having slaved away in a coal mine or a or a or a steelworks or a factory with no health and safety or in a cotton mill, you know, they go, oh, well, you know, actually, okay, so it's a bit muddy, but actually, you know, you know, I, it's just as dangerous working in a munitions well, factory than it is being in a frontline trench. That's really a good point, Taff. I want to just jump in because, you know, as a Second World War historian, if we go back to the First World War, probably a lot of these lads are from families where one child has died in the family or certainly their parents' yeah. generation, they've been dead, they, they, they've had more experience of death than, yeah. than probably yeah. people today have on, yeah. a, on a routine yeah. basis across. Yeah. You know, take 30 guys in 1914, they've probably all been to funerals of a yeah. sibling yeah. or at least yeah. a next door neighbor, as not just yeah. in 
disease, but pit accidents and, yeah, and all that yeah, awful yeah. stuff that happened on the railway yeah. line. So, I mean, so, it's, so it's this, this idea of it all being tragic and they're surrounded by death, they're, they're kind of used to that in a weird way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, de death was something that the, that the British public were absolutely used to, and uh, and and it was very very common. You know, it's like, oh, Mrs. Miggins, oh, you know, you lost another one. What was it? This? Oh, it was this one. Mm. You know, and it, it that it, it was the world they lived in. And of course, you know, of course, every death's a tragedy, but in the grand scheme of things, it you know, it it, it wasn't to them. It wasn't it, it wasn't they didn't have the, the sort of the emotive stuff wrapped around it that we do. I mean, Peter Hodgkinson's done some fantastic stuff about how the uh, almost the kind of stiff upper lip a British stiff upper lip has gradually shrunk that the First World War, the people of the First World War coped, uh, certainly at the end of the Battle of the Somme. Um, uh, th th there's some great stuff that uh, that, um, that they've done down at University of Kent, looking at uh, the newspapers and the reactions of the public at the end of the Battle of the Somme. There's no sense of actually this has been too expensive. We need to knock it on the head. It's very much actually all these fellows have been killed. We need to finish this. We need to carry on. And and I think that that we misunderstand that and that that the modern generation simplified this into oh what would I have thought? How would I have been? Well, it wasn't you. You know, they are just like us. They're, they're very similar people. And put in the same situation, you would probably have reacted in the same way they did. But standing back so many years later, it's impossible for most people to put themselves in that position, not because they wouldn't have done the same, but because they don't have the context and the yeah, perspective that helps them understand it. Oh, you muted yourself, Lucy. <laughs> There we go. Um, I got so excited there. But you know, we often come back to contextualising things and obviously not looking in hindsight at this stuff. And it's it's one of the weird things that you mentioned actually about sort of the change in wider societal values and and living standards and all of that kind of thing. Because yeah. on one hand, yes, everybody can relate to losing a loved one. You know, everybody at some point loses someone close to them. And so we can relate to that very human response to that. But what we can't or what's much more difficult to understand is how the value of life has changed to a degree yeah. because of the way society has moved forward. And yeah. we are very, very lucky, very, very fortunate yeah. now that, you know, such things are as they are. Um, but I want to come back. I want to come back to just a letter. Actually, actually, before you do that, the, the point you've just made is really is really is a really good point. Um, in 1992, I took the Khaki Chums to, to Passchendaele. It was the um, it would have been the 75th anniversary, and there were quite a lot of veterans still there at the time. And one of whom was Donald Hodge, who was the president of the First World War Veterans Association. He was a Kitchener volunteer. He joined in September 1914. I think he was seventh Royal West Kent. Uh, he fought at the Somme. He'd, he'd fought at Third Epe. He'd been wounded. And in the conversation after the service at Crest Farm at Passchendaele, I was talking to him and something I'd said to him about how it's a shame that the public pitied them because the, the First World Veterans, most of the ones I met, hated the fact that, that what the public saw as sympathy the veterans took as pity and they really didn't like that because they they completely got what they'd done and, and a lot of public misunderstand it and think that they need pity. And he mis misheard what I said and he thought I said that I pity them. And he poked me in the chest and he said, no, 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 you don't understand the world we lived in. You know, we we, we, we left school at like 11 years old. We, we worked six day weeks. We rarely had a day off. Um, the, the wages were rubbish. You know, I hardly ever had a holiday. Most of my family were dead before they were 50 or they ended the days in the workhouse with the men and the women split up. Mm -hmm. And suddenly along came this great adventure. And suddenly I had the first new pair of boots I'd ever had. I'd got new clothes. I'd got decent food, fresh air, exercise, foreign travel. When would I ever have gone abroad? But the thing he said next changed everything for me completely and, and literally led right here, right now to what I do now. He said, what you could never understand as long as you live is it can be better to get yourself killed as a 20 something year old than to see an endless line of drudgery stretching ahead of you that you knew you'd never escape from. And there's not a wow. single person watching this who could get their head around that. We just can't. You know, here in sunny Suffolk, all the fields around here, all those farm hands up at four in the morning, water the horses, feed the horses, harness the horses, back breaking, work until lunchtime, half hour off, do the same thing in the afternoon, reverse the process in the evening, go home. Oh, it's getting a bit dark. No electricity. Can't read. Can't do anything else. Go to bed. And you're going to do that every day. Oh, it's Sunday. I've got a day off. Well, actually, I've got to go to church. I've got half a day off. And they are going to do that day in, day out, till they're too old, too ill, or too dead to do it again. And suddenly, 
this seismic event happens, which broke that pattern. And it's hardly surprising that so many of them didn't go back to that life. They'd suddenly go hang about, you know, technology. I could be a driver. I could be a mechanic. I could be a, yeah, I could be an aircraft mechanic. I can be a, a post office uh, GPO telephone engineer because I've learned all about signaling. And suddenly it broke that pattern of just an endless life of nothingness. But the, the idea that you could go, to be honest, I've had 20 odd years, not too bad, actually. And this has been different. It's it got me out of that monotony. I mean, Pete Simpkins, Professor Pete Simpkins, when he wrote his book, Kitchener's Army, I can remember him saying to me, he said, the thing that fascinated me, everyone bangs on about king and country. Oh, they all joined for king and country. He said, when you went through the letters in the Imperial War Museum, National Archives, when you went through the letters, hardly anybody mentioned king and country. The stuff that drove recruitment in 1914 was people being bored with the day jobs and wanting an adventure. They're excited, yeah. you know, like Mark's, Mark's family, they're all coal miners and, you know, yeah. The yeah. brothers joined up like that because you know what's better get out of the mines, you know. Yeah. It's, it's yeah, it, that was it was an opportunity. That's it. War yeah. was an opportunity, yeah. and that is a yeah. difficult one. I mean, I uh, do think people still join the army now to break out of routines like that. There yeah. is that kind yeah. of line to it. I mean, yeah. that's that's been a recruiting method for the, the army as long as it goes back, <laughs> yeah. isn't it? You know, join the yeah. army, see the world. It's it's one of those things. But I think the thing that you struck on is. It's, yes, this idea of, of, of monotony, of boredom, of, of just knowing that there is no way you're getting out of this. And here is perhaps yeah. an avenue. And if it leads to yeah. death, that's a gamble worth mm. paying. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Think, and that, and that's, both, that's the bit that we struggle with now. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think you both made a point about this idea that there has to be a, an actual um, reason you can write down why people go to war. It, it, it is for King. It is for the world a better place. But I think people can just fight for something without really knowing what it is. But just an yeah. abstract idea that I'm yeah, fighting yeah, yeah, yeah. generally in the line of yeah. something moving forward. But I couldn't actually articulate to you what it yeah. is. Is, is it yeah. a better life? Yeah. Is it to not have to work so hard in the fields? Yeah. But they, you know, most people I couldn't have actually articulated it. But they, there's yeah. a sense of of it being something and this idea we've yeah. got stuck with where the war was all about nothing and it was futile that is just as yeah. much of a a myth of as as, as the as it all being yeah. trenches i don't think that the thing to remember is that whatever reason that they joined at the outset you know what why did i join well it was uh, it might be this might be that in the end suddenly you find yourselves actually it's the group of blokes that i'm with yeah and that, that would be the evolve, same how the trenches evolve yeah yeah and, and and that's the same whether you're talking to first war soldiers, whether you're talking about fellas, you know, in northwest Europe or in Burma in the Second War or fellas now. You know, at the end of the day, it's, in the end, it'll always come down to the fellas that, that, that you're fighting with. Your mates, irrespective of the reason yeah. that you joined. Yeah, I mean, I, I think... sorry, Lucy, you said at the beginning you kind of brought me in because I can talk about Kit. And that's another thing that I'm, you know, as long as I've known you, Taff, is that <laughs> you could hold a pair of boots in front of a modern school child and they go, oh my God, they're heavy. They're. they're but you could hold that in front of a 13 year old lad in 1914 or 15, and he would think that was the greatest thing he'd ever seen oh, a yeah. brand new pair yeah, of leather boots, yeah. and they're all mine, and I'm the first to have them, and they're actually my size. You know, yeah. that, that would yeah. have been the best yeah. Christmas present. And, and the, Absolutely, the shirt, they weren't handed down for my brother. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so we look at that kit as, a, you know, with, without thinking about it as being heavy and itchy and scratchy and things, but th that's not necessarily how half these guys are seeing it. No, I mean, the other thing to remember, I mean, yeah, we had some wonderful uh, deaf pupils in yesterday, yeah, was it? Yeah, it was yesterday uh, from Thetford. And um, they'd been working on a project looking at the photographs taken by a local photographer called Walton Burrell. And Burrell's two sisters were deaf. So th there was a connection with them. And they'd been looking at all these black and white photographs. And they came to us because um, the people organising the project they said, wouldn't it be great if they got to see what colour this stuff actually was? So what we'd actually done, we would got it all sorted out so that when they turned up, we got them dressed up. Go, well, actually... Here's hospital blue with the red tie, and here's a nurse's outfit, and here's this, that, and the other. And so when you get the first one togged up, go, what, 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 what's your first impression? He said, well, it's itchy. This would have been horrible. But, of course, at the time, most people's best Sunday suit was a suit of serge, whether it was blue or khaki or grey or brown or black or whatever. So they were used to the fabric. It, they weren't being given something that they weren't familiar with. So straight away, you're like, well, you're not comparing like for like. Um, and, and I was great fun with the teachers because sometimes I'll do uh, projects where I just go and talk to teachers, which is, uh, which, you know, in a way is much more useful than just talking to classes of school kids, much as I love that. But if you can if you can go and get the message across to a whole room full of teachers, then they can then go and disseminate that to a lot more people. And I'll say to them, right, OK, um, 
who does the stuff where you hand stuff out to, to the kids' uh, helmets? And oh, yeah, we all do that. Right, okay, right. So let's just try it. Right, you, stand up, right. Here's a helmet. The teacher puts a helmet on. What can you tell me about that? Oh, it's heavy. Right, okay. You, put this set of equipment on. Right, what can you tell me about that? Oh, it's heavy. Right, you, here's a rifle. What can you tell me about that? Oh, it's heavy. Okay, right. So what have we just learned? We've learned that everything's heavy, but none of it was heavy to a First World War soldier because he wore mm. it and carried it all of the time. So straight away, your big lesson here is that your lack of context and perspective means that you can't get the right message from it. So what you need to do, you need to go, yeah, the first time you pick it up, it's heavy as it was for a soldier of the First World War. By the time you've worn it for six months, every day, it's as light as a feather. And I mean, any anybody that's ever been on a living history bash where they've spent a week or whatever living in the stuff knows you take the clothes off, you take the boots off, and it feels like you're floating because it's... Yeah. You, you, you there, literally that, pick yeah. off this heavy weight. So it, it, it's it's that. It's it's the when you give people the context and they get it, they go, oh, this is, oh, fantastic. And so suddenly they can start applying that to other things. Um, I mean, one of my favorite things is the um is the okay, let's look at a soldier going into action. We'll pick the first day on the song because it's a you know, it's a it's a good a good example. So we get them togged up with all the basic kit. They've got their equipment. They've got the 120 rounds of ammunition. Uh, they've got the two pints of water. They've got the gas mask. They've got the helmet. So right, okay. So on the first day on the Somme, they have two extra bandoliers. So they've got another 100 rounds of ammunition. So they've got 220 rounds. They've got another gas mask. So they've got a spare. They've got a pick or a shovel if they're in the first couple of waves. Uh, they'll have at least two sandbags tied to the shovel or tied to the back of the belt. They've got two Mills bombs, not necessarily because they're going to use the grenades themselves, but because the bombing section are going to run out very quickly. So they can pass them up to the people that know how to use them. So, okay, right. And then you've got more togged up with this stuff. And, uh, and and so then you say, okay, so here's a question for you. Who thinks that advancing into heavy machine gun fire, carrying a lot of heavy weight and walking is a good idea? And they'll laugh. They'll always laugh. And they'll laugh whether they're a group of school kids or whether it's the British Legion or the WI or on one memorable occasion, a bunch of generals up at Chilwell. And then what will happen is there will be a gap of between 12 and 16 seconds when you say to them, right, why do they do that? And and again, it was the same even with the generals at Chilwell. And eventually after about 16 seconds, some bright spark will go, because it's too heavy. And that's the answer. Now, it's not too heavy because well-trained 14 to 50 year old blokes can run in it if they've been trained to do it. If they've done that day in, day out, that's not a problem. They can run in it. But from the time you get out of your trench, which is nearly always at the bottom of the hill, the Germans have occupied the high ground. They got to choose the battlefield. From the time you set off, you're nearly always going uphill. No man's land, as we've already said, isn't the big muddy wasteland usually, but what it always is, it's it's broken farmland, it's straggly weeds, you can't see the ground, you can't see the plow ruts, you can't see the shell holes that have grassed over, so you can't run in it. So the training of the time was that you advanced at a steady walk, and when you got within a certain distance, at that point, the whole line knelt down, they fixed bayonets, and they charged the last bit with lots of aggression, because if you had have charged up the hill, when you get to the top of the hill, you get to the German trenches. At that point, you've got to fight a German soldier yeah. hand to hand to the death. And he hasn't broken into a sweat yet. And who's going to win? Well, he will every time. So the whole purpose of the steady advance wasn't for Sir Douglas Haig and his brush and dustbin just to kill lots of British soldiers. It was to give them a better chance of survival when they got there. They came up with methods of dealing with it to limit the damage. They had what they called extended line, where you'd open out the gaps between you, and they'd rehearse and rehearse and rehearse this. So if the heavier the machine gun fire, you get out the trench, you'd open the gaps 10 paces, 12, 20 paces. The second row behind you, they're probably 20 paces, staggered in the gaps, likewise the one behind that. So as they're advancing, German Maxim machine guns, 600 rounds a minute, most of that's going through the gaps, because that had been the thing that always puzzled me. Why don't they all get killed? And it's literally because they'd found ways of limiting the damage. Obviously, a lot of people are going to get killed. The reason you've built trenches are to get you out of the line of direct fire. The minute you get out of trenches, people are start going to get killed in, in, in large numbers. Mm. But what you've not done, you've not given the soldiers anything they don't need to do the job. When they get to the German trench, if they capture it, they're going to need ammunition because the Germans will put a barrage on no man's land. No one's going to be able to bring you the ammunition. You know, you, you know, you're going to have to take that with you. The trenches, the front of the trench, the parapet is higher than the paradox at the back. Once you've captured it, it faces the wrong way. You need to turn it round. You're going to need picks and shovels. You'll need the sandbags. The fire step that you stand on to fire over the top of the trench is now on the wrong side. You've got to move it. So 
everything that they need, they have to take with them. But so there is no way around that. You need to carry that stuff with you. But what they do realize is that you have to then think about the timings. So the first day on the Battle of the Somme, they attack at half past seven in the morning. The French say the French set the time. It's a coalition war. The French set the terms. But if you attack at half past seven in the morning, you run out of steam in the middle of the afternoon. The Germans have all the rest of the hours of daylight to counterattack you. You can't do anything about it until it's dark. And so by the time you get to the September, on the 26th of September, they capture the high ground at Tietval, where the big memorial to the missing is now. And they attack in the early afternoon, because if you attack in the early afternoon, it's still broad daylight, which still seems nuts. But you run out of steam at dusk. You've then got all the hours of darkness. You can bring up more food ammunition mm. or manpower you can get rid of your wounded you can then use the hours of darkness to turn those trenches around you can build your sandbag emplacements the germans can't see to attack you until it's daylight and when they do they just keep bouncing off the germans launch umpteen counterattacks on the somme and not one single one of them is successful and it's that learning process both sides do it but it's that gradual learning process all the way people are going to get killed in that process but so, that, what's the alternative I, I think one thing that that you've kind of um everything you've said there yes all right we've spoken about the learning and we we do want we 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 understand that that happened but the one thing that struck a chord with me here tough is that actually it, putting the details forward in these things whether it be on tv whether it be radio film whatever but the details matter because the details aren't it's not there to bore people it's it's actually the details help you understand why this yeah. is it. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. When I when I go and like I say, I still occasionally go and do these talks for big groups of people with no specific interest. And I say at the outset, this, yeah, it is a talk about the First World War. But what it's really about, it's a talk about context, it's a talk about perspective, because it's the one thing or the two things that are always missing when we think about the First World War. It just is. Um, every time the BBC will do a news piece about the First World War, the words horror and slaughter will be in the first sentence. Now, it won't <laughs> matter whether it's a horrific battle which was a genuine slaughter, or whether it's a cute, cuddly teddy that some fella brought back, he found in the ruins and brought back for his daughter. It's always horror and slaughter. They don't say that about the Second World War. In fact, during the centenary, uh, an MP, we, we were up in Norwich doing a, a launch thing for one of the BBC's centenary things, and, and an MP said to me, oh, well, the thing you've got to remember, Taff, is that the, uh, the Second World War was a war of liberation. And you're like, hang about, you know, this is the same battlefield. <laughs> it's France that's occupied. It's Belgium that's occupied. Yeah, exactly. Quite a bit of liberating France and Belgium. You're not getting. <laughs> this is the whole, this is the whole, I mean, this is a can of worms that um, we'll have to come back to at some point. But the idea of um, the Second World War being the good war and, and the first being the bad war is is, is yeah. like a topic we could we could dive into for for yeah. a long time. Well, and, but, and this, is, this, a year this, or two, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But this, this crazy idea that these sort of cuddly, friendly Germans with these funny, spiky hats were like a friendly bunch. You know, go and tell the people at Dinon or or mm. Tamin who were who were just slaughtered out of hand to make sure that they didn't oppose the advancing German army. You know, it's that's it's just as frightful. It's it's no different than uh, than what happens a generation later. It, mm. it, you know, it, it, it needed dealing with. I, and we talked a little bit when you were on World War II TV about living history, Taff, in that, in yeah. that you know, like me, you don't have an, the formal qualifications for this stuff. It's all, and you yeah. started with kit, which I suppose I did yeah. in a, in a, in, a, in a way. And now you've and I was going to ask you, but you've completely answered this already. You know, understanding <laughs> the kit, understanding that moving forward at a walking pace, so you're not knackered when you get to the enemy. That has opened my eyes so much to understanding how. Yeah. the warfare works so you know yeah. you can get you can download as many hundreds of trench maps as you want and yeah. look at the distances between point a and point b but without understanding how these troops moved across those spaces you'll yeah. never understand how the battle that followed no. um, yeah. and yeah. Out. so the, the, yeah you've made the case that understanding the kit is the foundation and understanding that the that because that that's the basic tool of war the tool of war is that individual guy with his rifle and everything else yeah. kind of builds on that yeah. I mean, it's an it's an interesting thing. There's a number of bits there. I mean, first of all, people would often say to me, "Oh, you can't, you know, you can't jump. You don't know anything. You you can't possibly know anything." And you say to them, "Well, the old soldiers always had a saying: eighty percent of the time they were bored stiff, nineteen percent of the time they were frozen stiff, one percent of the time they were scared stiff." So ninety nine percent of that experience you can understand. Um, the 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 one percent. A, you don't particularly want to understand, but you can research it, you can talk to them, you can get a sense of it, and you'll understand it much more, as you say, by wearing the kit. I mean, I 
Back in 2001, the, the BBC did a series called The Trench, where we took 25 fellows from Hull and there to live the part in a trench system um, in, in, in France that we built at Flesquia. Uh, we actually had it up for the, the 20th anniversary. We put on a, a screening of it at Great War Huts. And it's as fresh and, 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 and good as it was 20 years ago. I mean, I hadn't seen it in 20 years, but it still does the job. It still really does explain the, you know, the, the life of the trenches better than anything that anyone's ever done, I think. But... Right at the outset, Richard Van Emden um, was a producer, one of the producers, and he rang me up out of the blue. I'd never spoken to him before. And he said, oh, hi, my name's Richard Van Emden. You won't know me. I said, actually, I do know you. I've got some of your books. And luckily, we hit it off straight away. In fact, I was sitting in this very room. And uh, so this is back in 2001, uh, in the June. And he said, um, I'm working on this thing for the BBC about trenches. Are you interested? I said, no. I said, we've heard all about it. We've read stuff in the newspaper and uh, it sounds awful. He went, no, 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 all that nonsense, all done and dusted. We've got a decent team in. We want to do it properly. And wherever we go, everybody says, if you want to do this properly, you need to speak to Taff and the Carkin Chums because they, they have an understanding of it that no one else will have at that level. So, OK, so we, we spoke a bit more about it. And um, and he said, well, I can't talk more now because I'm off to the summer. I said, well, fun enough, we're off to the SOM as well. The Chums were about to go off. It was the, uh, what would have been... Um, it must be 2001, so it was the 85th anniversary. So we arranged to meet him at Delville Wood. And he said, just before I go, he said, there's something that's really troubling me you might be able to help with. He said, I've been to the archive. I've been getting the film footage. He said, there's a particular piece of film of the first day on the Somme. The, the, the mine goes up on the Hawthorne Ridge, very famous piece of film footage. You see the public schools soldiers, the public schools battalion go charging up the hill. And a few minutes later, they start to come back. He said, but... They're not running back. They're not ducking and diving. They're just walking. And you can see them getting killed in the pictures, walking. He said, nobody can tell me why that's happening. Have you got any idea? I said, yeah, I know exactly why that is. Well, what is it? I said, I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to wait and see if you worked it out. So a few days later, we met him at Delville Wood. And that evening, in fact, we, we I mean, he st as, as we came marching down the road, it was our kilted Highland tour. So these fellas all come swinging down the road in the kilts. And he stood there with his mouth open. He said, this is incredible. You already do what we're trying to do. and Later that evening, we were at Dominic's Cafe in Pozier, and I said to him, have you worked it out yet? He, what? I said that bit about the film. Oh, no, no, no idea. Nobody can tell me. I said, okay, right, you, give me a jacket. You, give me your equipment. You, give me a helmet. So we togged him up with all the gear, gave him a rifle, took him outside and said, right, do you see the fourth lamppost? I want you to run up to that and run back as fast as you can. Go! And he goes tearing off up the road in this great long rush. He comes <laughs> roaring back again, and he gets in, and he's on his knees, and we kind of pick him up. I said, now do you get it? And you saw the light bulb come on because he suddenly understood that the adrenaline that had taken those fellas up the Hawthorne Ridge had burnt out completely. It's gone. By the time they got there, it's gone. So they've got nothing coming back. And they don't literally don't care whether they get killed or not, which is what you see happening. And in that moment, Richard Van Emden, who'd studied this for years, who'd met veterans going back to the 80s, in that moment, he understood the value of what they were about to try and do with the Trench TV series and the value of what, what we have done over the years wearing the kit, not for public display, but as a method of learning about it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that firsthand learning about it, and it doesn't matter how many times you read books, it doesn't give you that. You know, you could read Frank Richards' Old Soldiers Never Die. He talks about marching down the road and the clank of the mess tins and the smell of the wet surge and the feet stinging on the cobblestones. Most people have to imagine that. But, you know, I can hear that. I can smell it. I can taste it. You know, you just can because th there is no substitute for actually doing that to learn about it and understand it, which is which is really what the, the khaki chums did for 30 years. It was always the public display stuff wasn't really our thing. It was it was actually quite a selfish, almost Masonic lodge, which was about us learning, which then put us in a position where we could then share that knowledge for film, television, theatre, schools and all the other stuff that goes with it. So well, it taught it, you how to ask. You know, ask the right questions as well, isn't yeah, it? Because there have yeah. been comments in the sidebar about the fact that, unlike with World War II, there are there are no voices from the first Great War at any shape or form left now. Everyone yeah. is dead yeah. for decades now. So, yeah. but you did know some of those guys, like you knew yeah. the World yeah. War II guys. And so, yeah. having had the experience you had yourself, you could then engage with them. And uh, and we did the show yeah. with um and on World War II TV about Andrew Biggio with his rifle that he took out yeah. and put it in the yeah. hands of World War II veterans and how that <laughs> opened up. The conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the yeah, same thing yeah. with you is that you did yeah. have that, although yeah. you would never say that you had anything like the reality of it, but you no, had that no, shared yeah. 
shared basic yes. knowledge of I yes. know exactly how to put parties on and how difficult yeah, it is yeah. to get there. Yeah. And that would open up the exchanges that would that would, would then benefit your knowledge that then benefits our, our yeah. us today. And I'll tell you the fascinating thing, the really fascinating thing. You could meet a First World War veteran one week in your civilian clothes and have a conversation with him. And you could meet him two weeks later dressed in your first war kit and you'd have a very different conversation with him. It, I, I, I've, I, and actually, we found the same with the second one, with the, certainly the Suffolk Regiment veterans. In fact, Brigadier Bill Della once said to me, he said, Taff, will you, will you come with us to, to Holland and, uh, and, and just, just a few of you come just to, because I think it will get the old boys talking. And it did. It, it, it absolutely opens that up. And the old boys would tell you stuff that they wouldn't tell you if you're in your civilian kit. I know it's dark. They knew that you weren't a first war soldier, but it, it was almost a kind of portal that it opened and it let them do that. I mean, Everyone certainly. Yeah. It gives yeah. you more insight. It's yeah. like this, this yeah. you know, you get yeah. it kind of thing. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I think, you know, I, I, this idea, I, look, I've, I, I have very mixed views. I don't want to get into the whole living history things. It's a, it's a, it's a whole other topic. I have mixed views on it. I think that, but the, the key thing that I come back to the sort of to sum it up for me is when it's done well, it's very, very, very educational and very, very useful. And that kind of leads us back to this idea of the details being important. And, yeah. you know, I, I think that all kind of, it, it's all making, it's all linking together, you know, what we're talking about yeah. here. I mean, it's a funny old thing because the khaki chums never saw themselves as living historians or reenactors. It just wasn't really, it, it wasn't a direction that most of us had come from. There were certainly some, Colin Wright had, 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 had been the chairman of the World War II, what became the World War II Living History Association. But most of the chums had come from a background of being collectors. Uh, they were authors. They were experts of all sorts of different weird and wonderful stuff. Gary Hancock's great passion for, for packaging. You know, Gary, what's this wooden box? Ah, oh, that's a Type B7. It was used to this, this and this. And... Corelli Barnett, I always thought, hit the nail on the head because he said to me once, he said, what the khaki chums are is this huge knowledge resource depository. He said, because it fascinates me. He said, even just listening here, people just coming up and asking you fellas all sorts of stuff and they all know the answer. If they don't know, they know the bloke that does. And that was all just down to the fact that it was about, A, people who had their specialist obsessive interests and, and would really mind that. Um, but also because... And some didn't. Some some were just fellows who came along for the ride. It just thought, actually, I could really be up for that. And if they if they looked like they got the right attitude, they'd come along for the ride. But but most of the time, it we we we, we didn't do any of the public display stuff. And it, as I say, it was a pretty selfish thirty years of just learning mm -hmm. and sharing. And people from other groups sometimes came with us. But it was really just about getting an understanding of something. Because you could read about it as much as you like, but it was a very, very different thing. Even the even the manuals, you'd read in the manual, the manual says you do this, but you look at the photographs and none of them do that. But the minute that you wear it, you go, oh, well, that's why you wear the entrenching tool on the back, because if you wear it on the side, you can't sit down. And all this. and it's it's that. It's it's the helping to interpret. It's it's going back to what we always mm. say. It's great to listen to the old boys' memories. But the old boys weren't, in, you know, they, they weren't fallible very often. They, they, some of them literally made stuff up. A lot of them misremembered. Um, the, the manuals, which say it must be done like this, well, we've already established with the trench building that, you know, this is what the ideal is. But in reality, well, A, there's the practicalities of using with what materials we've got. And secondly, there's soldiers who, quite frankly, sometimes just can't be asked and they're going to do it the shortest, quickest way possible. So you have to take the whole thing in around. And I just think that, the, that what we did with the chums, the uniform side of it, is just one tiny element that helped explain all the others and was the glue that stuck a lot of it together. Um, so, and, and I, I completely agree that there are some groups even now who are very, very good. Um, and, and some who were just awful and uh, well, bless there them. Were, there were good books and bad books, good YouTube channels exactly and bad books. There, exactly there's, there's good in front of everything. But yeah, I, I'm yeah. not going to hog over Lucy's show, but but it, it, but I mean, just to bring it right back to the original, yeah. original concept of, of the misunderstanding of what trench warfare is and trench trench warfare, yeah. which is the best title ever, I think. <laughs> you're, you're chipping away with this in your school groups and the work you do, and you're chipping away with, you know, you get one victory out of three, I expect, with TV companies and production companies. And you, and yeah. you can do yeah. an audience of a few dozen, a few hundred here. Yes. It, obviously, it's worth keep on bang, banging the drum of trying to get the, the message across, but there is this huge billion billion people around the world who've got their vision of the first world war and they're and no they're not going to be shifted so why why yeah. why does it matter if if the world thinks something why why should you keep on doing i'm just being a well, devil's advocate there well i tell i mean you know 
back back in the 1960s when they made the TV series The Great War, BBC made The Great War, groundbreaking stuff, 24 part television series. The first part was not even anything to do with the war. It was the setup. And I can just imagine a commissioning editor agreeing to that now. Right. We're going to make this program. The first bit's not even going to cover the war. Um, and at that stage, Corelli Barnett said television. Television is going to be the way that we change the way that people think about the First World War. And what he hadn't factored in was the fact that the people who were going to make television were never going to let you tell the truth. Years later, Gary Sheffield says books are the way. Books are going to be the way that we re-educate the public and show them his excellent book, Forgotten Victory, amongst others. But, of course, the problem is that the people that buy Gary Sheffield's books and, and, and books are people it. who are already interested in the yeah. First World War. It never touches the rest. So how do you get to it? Well, one of the reasons that we decided to build our own First World War Museum and Visitor Center was specifically to get to those people who wouldn't otherwise, who you wouldn't otherwise get to. And do you know what? It works. Every time people come, we challenge those myths, we tell them stuff, and they don't go away going, you're a bunch of idiots, you know, that isn't what my granddad said. And very often if they say, well, that isn't what my granddad said, and said, well, what did your granddad say? Well, he said this. And, and you can, and then you'll see, like, well, actually, maybe he didn't quite say that. Maybe he said this. Maybe I remembered him saying yeah, something. Yeah. Exactly that, because what's happened is that the, the kind of media collective, oh, this was what you all need to think about the First World War, has, has literally subsumed everything else. And this, the, the worst thing about it is that, the media have taken this fascinating subject, every bit as fascinating as the Second World War, this, this war that was on virtually every continent that lasts uh, four years, that involved virtually every nation. And they've taken this fascinating subject, these millions of fascinating stories, and they've just squeezed it into a little ball and it's mud, it's blood, it's barbed wire. Everyone gets killed for nothing. The generals are all idiots. Oh, and there was a bit of poetry. Uh, but once you've squeezed it into that little ball, you cannot possibly tell most of the stories about the First World War because they don't fit your narrative. Yeah. So what they do, they tell the same story over and over and over again. We saw it all the way through the centenary. Everybody that made a bit of drama about the First World War, same story over and over again. In fact, I, I bored people with this enough, but the when we made the Sainsbury's Christmas Truce advert, they gave us literally a free hand, said, right, you, you just create what would have happened. And so knowing that there was going to be criticism of it just because there always is, we specifically based it on what had happened up at Wolverham, where the, the Norfolks and the company of the Cheshires had, had had a bit of a kick about with the uh, Germans of uh, it's right on the border between Infantry Regiment 16 and I can't think what the other one was now. We, we nudged out Infantry Regiment 16 because it was Hitler and we thought that might be problematic for the PR department at Sainsbury's. Um, but everything that we put on screen is what we knew had happened at that point. And even now, I will say that the most accurate piece of history throughout the entire centenary in terms of drama recreation was what we created for the Sainsbury's Christmas Truce advert because nobody challenged it. Nobody said to me, you can't do this. They just said, oh, just just, just, just do what you need to do. And, and they just let us get on with it, which was just wonderful. But it's frustrating. It's hugely frustrating. Likewise, throughout the centenary, the, all of the arts projects, there was nobody overseeing that it's right well here's a huge amount of money go away and create all this wonderful art all of it about dead blokes yeah. you know and i'm not demeaning dead blokes four of no. them related to me but 89 percent of those that went off to war came home again british men and women who went off to war 89 percent come home that means 11 percent got killed that's a lot of people i'm not demeaning it but 89 percent come home of which 60 percent had never once been in a field hospital with so much as a broken arm you know, that's a huge amount of people whose stories never get told. And they have some fascinating stories that really ought to be told to it's break out of that just very, very narrow. Oh, wasn't it all awful? Wasn't it terrible? And of course, you know, if someone's making a drama or whatever, they'll, they'll trawl through. A, if a soldier wrote home every single day of the war to his wife or his girlfriend, they'll trawl through every single letter till they find the worst day of the war when, oh, my mate's just been killed and it's raining. That doesn't well, tell you what this war was like. <laughs> This this sort of this sort of brings me back to um I mean when we're talking about letters I'm I'm just looking through some letters that come, come from a family friend a lot a stack of them they're amazing I always get a buzz from handling these things you just do don't yeah, you it's like, you do. and and I'm looking through them and you know they're just they're just boring I mean yeah. most of it yeah. is is yeah. is yeah. their board and they're just yeah. quite boring I mean they're they're interesting yeah. in the fact that it's for what they are but there's nothing in there that's particularly groundbreaking it's no. chit chat it's small talk yeah. and it's just saying yeah. that things are pretty dull and I'm not up to much when yeah. you you know when you and that kind of brings us I suppose full circle into this this conversation of it is yeah it it you know trench warfare there there was a it lot is, of that. <laughs> 
<laughs> that might make good TV. You know, this is what I constantly get told when I say I want to talk. You know, I want to do a show about this. I want to do a show about that. Look at all these amazing stories that haven't been been tapped into. Well, you know, we're not really sure our audience are going to connect with that. Is you know, is there a celebrity involved? You know, first question, no. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, that's yeah. that's a mark yeah. on it against you. You know, and the second one is just well, you know, we want to we want to tell something new and uncovered and secret, but it's got to be about these four things. <laughs> You know, yeah. basically, and it's got to be about yeah. what they already know about, but just a yeah. new bit, you know, Hitler yeah. something or other, or yeah, yeah, yeah. First War yeah. song something or other. And it is very, very difficult to break that cycle. But I always, the thing that makes me angry about it is it does a disservice to, as you say, to all of the yeah. stories and all the amazing stuff that doesn't get told. And it's so rich. It is so rich. And, yeah. I, I, you know, besides, you know, military historians picking the commissioners next time they, you know, they come up, the jobs come up. I don't really yes. know. It's, 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 I think, reflective of a wider dumbing down, perhaps. But with the first, the first World War, it's almost like it's, it's become. You can be accused of being disrespectful for challenging that narrative. That's almost, you know, it's almost that way of like, oh well, you know, if you don't talk about the Somme and and you know, all the horrific waste and Passchendaele and all the men that died, then in some way you're being disrespectful. That's always the kind of the feeling I get when I speak yeah. to these people in television. I mean, I, I can remember um, having this, the, the, the only time I've brought a, a room full of them to a standing stop uh, in the midst of a, an argument, which was me versus all of them. I think, I think it might even have been something ridiculous, like um, like country file or something like that, with their centenary stuff. And I just said that, you know, if you if you pick somebody who was who was incredibly successful nowadays, pick, pick a, a you know a footballer or somebody like that who's incredibly successful, and um, you know, and say right, well, how many goals has he scored? How many times has he played for his team? Uh, is he popular with the manager? Do the fans love him? Um, you know, has he been picked for England? How many times has he played for England? If the answer to all those things is yes, 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 you know, he's hugely successful. He's going to be known forever. Now imagine a time. 75 years, 85 years, 100 years, 110 years down the road, when the only time that he was ever mentioned, the only stuff ev anybody ever spoke about was was the times he was sent off, the goals he missed, mm. you know, and, and the games he lost. Because that that is what the British have done with First World War soldiers. That's exactly what we've done. And you cannot shy away from that. We've taken... Oh, mic the, drop. The, yeah, it is a <laughs> mic drop. It's a mic drop moment. Well, but we've taken the, what what literally was the most successful, most well trained army in British history, because by 1918 they just were, who literally won the most successful campaign. The the, the fighting in the what what was known as the last hundred days, they win more battle honours, they capture more ground, they take more prisoners, they capture more guns than at any other point. And there's not one person in a thousand in this country that knows that, which is uniquely british i suspect in terms of not knowing our most famous british campaign but but to have achieved all that and it was a proper victory i mean people go oh yeah what about the americans and there's this wonderful map of the, uh, the of the western front which was on Hague's wall so douglas Hague's wall and they, they they sort of put the pins in every day as divisions moved around and you can see the whole of the western front from the belgian coast to the swiss border and you can see that the french the the belgians the the british the the, uh, the americans the french again and the germans opposite them and opposite the americans yeah you know, the germans had got like you know one or two divisions opposite all of these americans um right up in the north they've got hardly anyone opposing the belgians um, opposite most of the French army in the south, they're just like a couple of German divisions. But by the time you get further north, by the time you get opposite, I think Manjan's French Fifth Army, they, then it's pretty much one to one because they're frightened of Manjan. But opposite the British, even though we know that by September 1918, the German divisions are running short of manpower, so they're not going to be at full strength, the Germans have concentrated virtually every division they've got opposite the British. You know, you don't need me to tell you that the the, the, the Germans knew who was about to beat them in September 1918. Hindenburg and Ludendorff knew who was about to beat them. It wasn't the Belgians. It wasn't the French. It certainly wasn't the Americans, even though everybody was in that effort. The people who were about to beat them were the British and the Germans knew it. And it's shameful that all these years later that 
that has been distilled down into, yeah, but it's all about dead blokes and idiot generals, because it just wasn't. This was a enormous national effort. It wasn't just soldiers. It wasn't just generals. It's the civilians at home. It's the logistics. It's the everything. The whole empire had, had come together to make that successful campaign at the end. And the Germans were defeated. You know, you can, you know, faff around as much as you like about, oh, well, it was only an armistice, blah, blah, blah. But they were utterly defeated. They there wasn't another defence between there and the Rhine. There, there was nothing behind them and there was nothing stopping them apart from the fact that the British were about to outrun their own supply lines and couldn't have kept it going. So it was quite convenient that there was an armistice. I think, you know, sure. I, I was just saying, I think this is it. This is it, Taff, really. And this is what, you know, hopefully with, you know, and this has come up pretty much in every show again, is just this idea of, of how we remember. And I'm sure we'll do some shows digging into this in particular, because that changes nation to nation. Different nations have yeah. different, different yeah, uh, memories, yeah. cultural memories of, of the yeah. first, um, yeah. first war. I mean, I think, you know, this is a, a good to know. I don't want to keep you all night. You know, um, it's been, it's been really, nothing time, has, time has flown. Like, we'll have to get you back to dig into some of this a bit more. You know, that would be amazing. But this is kind of hopefully what we're trying to do here on World War TV is to challenge these things. And, yeah. To, yeah. You know, and it's not because, oh, you've got it wrong, you know, and you're silly or or anything like that. Yeah. It's about unpicking it. And some people will still disagree. You know, we oh, had, yeah, yeah. Yeah. had Peter Hart talking about Hague and some people still disagree and, and we'll say no he's the butcher and they'll say he's the butcher until you know until they're yeah. blue in the face because but, that but i think that, the i think that there's there's you know people can say that but i think that what gradually happens over time is that you just keep presenting the evidence that shows that they're talking nonsense yeah. i mean my favorite thing with generals was back in 2014 um we worked with Jeremy Paxman. I worked with Jeremy Paxman a few times. He's brilliant. And he was making his programme Britain's Great War. And the original mantra for the BBC's centenary coverage was no poets, no trenches. And then very quickly they realised, like you have, you can't actually make the story of the First World War without trenches and a bit of poetry. And so he came to our old trench site in Ipswich and we were we were making the, this sort of section about trench warfare. And they'd had a bit of camera trouble. So he and I sat in the dugout and we were just chatting. Um, but his idea of chatting isn't like anyone else's idea of chatting. You're like, well, what about this? And what about that? And as fast as you go, uh, come up with an answer, he's back it straight at you. And he said, look, thing is, Taff, what you can't get around, these blasted generals, miles behind the line, completely out of touch, you know, absolute nonsense, living in their fancy chateau. I said, OK, Jeremy, let, let, let me just pitch something to you that I use with the school kids. Imagine this, that imagine there's a dead straight brick wall and it's 50 miles long. Okay, dead straight brick wall, 50 miles long. Now imagine that you're standing right in the middle of it with your feet touching it. How much of the wall can you see? But if you're 20 miles back on a clear day, and it won't always be a clear day, now how much of the wall can you see? And in that moment, you saw the light bulb appear amongst the above the brilliant Paxman brain. <laughs> and in that second, Jeremy Paxman understood command and control. If you're too close to the front line, you can't control it at all. The further back you are, you can see what's happening. You go, actually, the Lancashire Fusiliers are held up on the left. I can't do anything about that. But on the right, the good old Essex Regiment have break, broken through. I've got some reserves. I'll send them to the right and they can help the Essex and we'll make a breakthrough. The job of the general isn't to be in the front line. That's the job of second lieutenants and captains, you know, and that whole process you know, the, 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 the commander of the British armies in France says, actually, gentlemen, what I'd like you to do is capture Bapalm, go away and come up with a plan. You know, the corps commanders, the divisional commanders, brigade commanders gradually come up with plans. They make all this work. It's distilled down to the battalion commanders, the company commanders, eventually to the platoon commanders who have to go and make it work. And, you know, as Peter Hart no doubt said, you know, you cannot run an, a, an infantry division in a tiny little French hovel with the roof off. You just can't. And the thing is that, these people, a, 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 a brigadier general, a major general, lieutenant general, they're not a title. That's a job. Mm. You know, if you're a major general, you're in command of an infantry division. If you're a brigadier general, you're in command of an infantry brigade. If you're a lieutenant general, you're in command of an army corps. Now, you can't run an army corps if you're a lieutenant general with a secretary. You need a whole staff. You've got to have meteorological officers, gas officers, artillery officers, engineering officers, signaling officers. You're going to need cartographers, you're going to need clerks, you're going to need cooks, you're going to need grooms. All of that needs office space for a start. And 
Luckily, the French and the Belgians had built all these big fancy chateaux all over the country, which gave you places to run these huge organisations from. So that's why they're in chateau. They're not in chateau so that Sir Douglas Haig can have fancy bed sheets and a nice comfy pillow. They run out of chateau because they have to, because you can't do it in a broken cow shed with a hole in the roof. This, you is, just this, is, why, this is why the structure of, of the army is there. And we know, yeah. we know very well when that structure fails and when it's not there or when it gets tweaked. Yeah. By someone yeah. with a, you know, it doesn't yeah. work. You know, I'm thinking, no. you know, I'm thinking Irwin in Arakan in Burma. Yeah. You know, yeah, when, when yeah. you take exactly. yeah. part yeah. of the command structure yeah. out, yeah. it all yeah. goes. Well, first war generals, first war generals getting themselves killed because oh, I must go and have a look. You know, and, and there's a general killed for every week of the war. You cannot replace that experience and that knowledge. It's going to take a long time to replace that. I mean, it's fascinating. It's, oh, General Hague's a butcher and all that. Well, you know, d during the Somme, the Somme's a good example. The, you know, the, the, the London division attacking High Wood, they capture, they do everything mm -hmm. that he's asked them to do. But afterwards, he says to the, the, the divisional commander, you've done a very good job, but it was too costly. And he sacks him because it's cost too many lives to do it. So it's, you know, it, it, it literally doesn't make any sense, the whole idea that you just carelessly waste lives. But at the same time, the fact is that twice in the last century, the Germans tore up the rule book and fought total war. And at that point, when you decide that you're going to fight them, you've got a choice. You either fight them as, as long as they're prepared to fight and a bit longer, as hard as they're prepared to fight and a bit harder, or you lose. There's nothing in between. You're either going to win or you're going to lose. And what made people like Sir Douglas Hager the right bloke for the job was the fact that he's chief of staff or, or chief intelligence officer. Kidgel could come in and go, right, there you go. Go the last three days fighting 120,000 casualties. And he could go, actually, yeah, not too bad. Do that again tomorrow. And nowadays we go, oh, that's too expensive. Mm. And you'd lose. And that, that, that there is the bit that you can't square. You cannot square that circle. Mm. You know, you can't say that's too costly because put a price on it. What was it worth? You know, what? <laughs> yeah, all of these things. You know, what? What? What was it worth to defeat the Nazis? What was it worth to defeat the Kaiser's army? You know, all of these things will come with a cost. And in the end, if you go, oh, that's a bit too expensive, and you backpedal, it'll either go on a lot longer, as we saw with what happened in Afghanistan and Iraq, or you go, no, we need to keep the foot to the floor and we just need to beat them because the quicker we beat them the quicker it'll be over and and it'll stop and that's yeah. and i think that, that you know never change <laughs> woody asked earlier you know why why did why keep going why keep sort of banging the drum and it's just the idea that this is what this is whatever kind of historian you are whether you're you know in academia or not yeah. or you're a public historian whatever you know you got to keep banging the drum because that's how it works that's how you change people's minds actually and yeah. i think you know the work you do taff in particular i think is is you know arguably more important because you're out there you're talking to kids and your trench system that you've got i've been lucky enough to visit it, it is bloody amazing you know and <laughs> and that we well, can't beat that tangible mm. even yeah. just a slither of experiential yeah. kind of involvement yeah. in something well, if you well, say taff is moving yeah. on a to, to, to bring a World War II crow, he's moving on an Eisenhower broad front. He's using media, he's yeah. using museums, yeah. he's using school talks and, yeah. and podcasts and YouTube and everything else. So you're you're tackling it in every way possible. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, I, and I'll tell you the other thing that's, that's important. You've mentioned the school kids. Now, education, obviously, it's important. We're now getting school kids come down from Edinburgh, from Falkirk, from Southampton, from West Wales. They're coming because they like, actually, there's, there's something worth listening to here. But the level of education that we're pitching this at isn't school kids because school kids get it school kids will always get it the yeah. level this is aimed at is middle-aged and early age pensioners because they are the people that go to museums they are the people who tell other people they're the people who come back again but much more importantly they're the people that will turn up with one idea in their head yeah and will go away with something completely different they're in the entrenched they're, yeah well, that's right. that's exactly <laughs> that but every single time, what's wonderful, you, you can you can have 100 people in the room and you know that by the time they've walked out, they've had their view of the First World War turned 180 degrees yeah. in a way that they've taken on board themselves. It isn't me going, well, I think it's right, what you think is wrong. It's me going, have you ever thought about it like that? Yeah. And they go, yeah. bloody hell. And that, that's the answer.
that's the answer. And I think, Taff, you know, that is as good a note as any to, to end it on for, but I hope you come back. I mean, I oh, think... Part we, two, part two, part two. Yeah, like, we could go on. Honestly, there's, I've got so many more questions and so much that I want to pick your brain about because, as I said at the beginning, you are the man that I come to for, for answers in so many things. And, you know, your passion for the subject and the way you share it is... You just can't beat it. Um, so, yeah, we'd love to have you back on. But, yeah, you know, it'd be a pleasure. Yeah, thank you so much. Woody, have you got any any further questions or No, I just I, I mean there's been a couple of mic drop moments today, which is just it's fantastic. You know, I mean I, I, I'm on this journey with a lot of the viewers that I know a little bit about I, I know a little bit about the First World War, but I'm realizing what I know is actually false. But I'm I'm of the of the type of person that I want to have my ideas challenged so I can move forward. And and that's how I how I am when I'm educating people about the Second yeah. World War. So it's just it, it's fan fantastic to be part of this project where we're, we're in a little way we're just pushing things forward and and and, and uh, uh, kind of there, there was one, right, right at the outset when Lucy was telling me about this about how you know how you how you sort of take a second war audience and make them think about it and there was a very telling thing that cropped up one of our um, visitors a couple of weeks ago said to me he said oh of course you know but uh, but you know you, you you have to bear in mind that there were no Somme's and Passchendaele's in the Second World War and you go but there were. We were just incredibly lucky that the British weren't involved in them. But yeah. if you look over to the east yeah. at Stalingrad, in one battle alone, the Germans and the Red Army lose more men in one battle than the British Army lose in both world wars. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And if there's a figure to leave people on that makes them get their head around the fact that actually, whilst we have an image of the First World War as just mindless slaughter and everyone gets killed, you know, it, it doesn't even scratch the surface of the amount of Russians who were killed in the Second World War. There's 20 million Russians killed in the Second World War, admittedly a fair few by Stalin himself. But that was half the British population at the time. Yeah. And it's a very uniquely British thing that we always beat ourselves up over, oh, you know, everybody gets killed. Well, actually, you know, you stood a far higher chance of coming home in the British Army than you did in most of the others. You really did. Wow. And um, and that's that's stuff that really just needs to gradually get out there and people start to get their heads around it and, and get an understanding. Because even the Second World veterans, even dear old Frank Varley, I remember him saying, of course, you know, you know that, that first war, my dad was in the first war, that was much worse than ours. And, and you say to him, actually, mate, you spent the winter of 44, 45 up to your waist in freezing cold, muddy water in Holland being shelled by Neville workers like, for 10 hours a day. I really don't think that your dad would have seen any difference between what he was on the receiving end. In fact, it was probably much worse. So even then, even Second War veterans had this idea that this sort of First War thing was much worse, even though, like I say, they what they went through second time around was every bit as bad in, in many instances. Definitely. Well, look, I think, you know, as usual, uh, and I always, this is becoming my catchphrase is, you know, if I end the show with more questions than when we started, <laughs> it's a good one, you know. Um, yeah. So, yeah, we'll have to have you back. Thank you so much for joining us it's tonight. A pleasure. Yeah. It's a pleasure. Really enjoyed it. Thank you Great very much. We'll be along as well. Um, yeah. that's it guys for, for another show thank you for joining us um, if you do ever get the chance as well to, to head over to Great War Hearts um, we'll, we'll chuck some links on the bio if we haven't already for the video please do check it out um, it's amazing it really is a wonderful project um, and yeah uh, do all the usual things like subscribe and um, we will be back next week uh, uh, next Saturday, 21st, with uh, Melissa Wing talking about the Donut Girls, which is, um, yeah, something I hadn't heard of until I met Melissa, but it's uh, really, really interesting. Um, thank you very much, and yeah, have a good day, have a good evening, wherever you are. <laughs>